No, I'm not. I'm a true bred Scot, and I'll just oh, thank you. Scot, Scotland, of course. Pre-century history is my field, you see. Ah, well, maybe not, but just you watch your lip or I'll put you across my knee and lad up here. <laughs> oh, this is going to be fun. Welcome, uh, ladies, gentlemen, and servo robots, to the 90th production of an unearthly podcast, streaming live on the 28th of January 2015, and featuring The Wheel in Space, written by David Whitaker. I am Bill Sylvia, the man in black, and with me are Mad Matt Winchell. Hello. Randy Ronson McCulloch. Always a pleasure. Aaron Romeo Moon Burke. And Tim the Enchanter Sheridan. Hey! Before we uh, cut into our regular news this week, uh, Tim has uh, had, an, uh, I, I presume, an interesting weekend. Uh, Want to tell us a bit about uh, where you were and uh, what you did? Oh, yes. I went down to uh, Washington, D.C. to uh, go to the Festival of MAG. Or, as it's commonly known, MAG Fest. Yes, the music and gaming festival. I went there with my Muppet friend, Gary Indiana. And uh, we both had a fine time going to panels, playing video games and arcades. We got some cool swag. Zag, uh, swag, I uh, had f photos taken with some cool people. People, uh... We went to a voiceover panel, panel uh, where we uh, met Wes Johnson and Matt Mercer, as well as the Atop the Fourth Wall Live panel. Oh, nice. Oh, it was a lamp preview. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, it was one of those, like, tall... Lamps that had like the the, the multi bulbs in each uh, separate thing that you had to turn on each separately. <laughs> that joke will never die. Yeah, I also there's also a screening of the Angry Video Game Nerd movie. Sweet, How nice. Was it? it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was a good experience uh, seeing it with a group of people instead of just watching it by myself. Mm-hmm. You know, it was one of those movies that had that has to be seen in a group. Group. Uh, a funny thing is, uh, while I was there, I purchased three uh, prints from Geek Boy Press, uh, featuring my uh, three favorite doctors. Ah. Doctors uh, Patrick Troughton, John Pertwee, and Colin Baker. And uh, someone saw the uh, Patrick Troughton print and said. Oh, is that Rocky? Ouch. Yeah. Uh, to be fair, it, it, it wasn't a photograph, it was a caricature. And now that I think about it, 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 if you squint your eyes, Patrick Troughton does look an awful lot like Sylvester Stallone. I'm just thinking of uh, um, Patrick Troughton punching out a Cyberman. <laughs> I could find that. People usually amusing. mistake him for an early era Beatle. That too. Mm. <laughs> it's or Mo Howard. <laughs> the son of Mo Howard. I also went to a uh, John Tron Q and A. Oh, cool. Hey, and I actually made John Tron laugh, which I am extremely proud of. Sweet. Proud of, and I I didn't even have to do much. All I said was hello. Well, a actually, my uh, Muppet friend who was with me, he was on my arm. Uh, he's always hanging on my arm. And my Muppet friend, Gary Indiana, said, Hello! And uh, he just, John Tron just lost it. <laughs> That's good. Um, cool. 
So maybe I we'll would be able to see a video. That'll be nice. Yeah. Usually, a lot of Q and A's they tend to record at Magfest. Mm-hmm. I'll have to look that up. Mm-hmm. But I had a great time, and I definitely think I'll be going again next year. I've always wanted to get to Magfest, but I, I have no money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've I've wanted to go to Magfest for the past four years, and it just hasn't come up as a possibility at that time, this time of year. The only thing I've been warned about was yeah. The only one, only thing I've been warned about so far about Magfest is if you don't have a particular panel or two to go to, you might find it a little meh. But I can honestly see myself being constantly busy the entire time myself, so. Yeah, I, I, I figure most people that I know would go there and end up just, like, I wouldn't even care about the, like, I would almost go to MAGFest just, like, at least, not maybe not now because I'm not currently running any shows, but there have been times when I would have been willing just to go to MAGFest, go to a hotel room, not even pay for attendance to the convention, and just film crossovers all week. That would be nice. Or just getting cameos all weekend, too. <laughs> Yeah. I hear Diamanda Hoggins usually up for if she's not busy. The the fun thing about the Atop the Fourth Wall live was that there were about uh, seven people cosplaying as Fat Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, Fat Grandma is officially one of my favorite characters that Linkara has dreamt up, and mostly on a whim. I think I've seen it like once or twice when he first came up with it. Oh, it's he's really used caught at least, on though, huh? Yeah, oh, he caught on. He's used it like six times or more, and not only in his own videos either. I've kind of stopped watching Linkara and a lot of the others. Linkara, I still maybe watch SF every week. Debris and, uh, yeah. Except for maybe uh, Todd in the Shadows and um, what do you call it? SF Debris occasionally. Yeah, Todd, I try to catch up when he has huh? something interesting. Anyway. As of February last year, I pretty much fell behind on all of my review shows. Right now, I'm up to date on watching Stuff You Like and uh, whatever Sophie's calling her show nowadays because it seems to change every couple months. Yeah, she's a little unsure what to call her show or what to do with her show, to be honest, once in a while, it seems. Anywho. Um, news then? Uh, yeah, I think Let's that brings it. us to our regular news, uh, which is a little less actual. Well, before we do it, does anybody uh, have any other pre-news life events they wanted to talk about today? I've got a lot of stress, but hopefully, maybe it'll be able to work itself through, but uh, that's for another time. I, I, I misread things on my taxes, and I thought I was making a good amount back, and instead I'm getting pretty much nothing. Oh, lame. So I'm not happy. Yeah. No, our our most exciting thing this week was an epic fet quest to find printer cartridges. So da, da, that was da, da, that was about it. Da, da. Okay. Well, in uh, in the news, uh, we have uh, our latest entry. Unfortunately, two lost stories. Uh, those those in the Doctor Who story that are no longer with us. Uh, in this case, is actor Barry Ingham at the age of uh, nine. Um, yeah, the age of nineteen eighty two. There we go. At the age of 82, uh, who played Paris uh, from the Ho from the Homer stories and the Myth Makers. If he was uh, 1982, see. that would be real news. Yes, that is true. Uh, he apparently also featured in uh, Doctor Who and the Daleks in 1965, uh, where he played a Thal. Oh, in the movie version? Yes. Oh, where he played a Thal. Okay. One of the Thals. Yeah. All right. uh, hmm. Apparently, he also appeared in Star Trek: The Next Generation in the episode "Up the Long Ladder." Mm. I've, I've, I... uh, yeah. he, did, he, he did. He did get a good run in at the age of eighty-two, uh, and I'm thinking it looks like they did not give a reason. So, we don't know whether or not he's part of our cancer list. So sad that we have a cancer list. Yeah, at eighty two though, you gotta stop worrying about that kind of thing. You're just like, if I die, I've had a good I've had a good I've had a good run at it, you know? 
I mean, sure, you're not George Burns living until you're over 100. You're not um, Keith Richards, who will outlive us all. But you've had a good attempt, so what can you say? Yeah. Right. Always look on the bright side of life. And I'm not going to go any further into the song, because that would really waste our news time. Yeah. <laughs> Don't make Tim start singing again. <laughs> oh. Ooh. Oh. Ugh, <laughs> oh, Aaron. Oh. Oh, I, I believe this knife in my back is yours. <laughs> oh. I wasn't actually going to mention anything on that during the broadcast. <laughs> Next article. Anyway... <laughs> I think all that's right. all we can really say about that. Yeah. yeah. All right, next up, uh, former Dr. David Tennant has won an award for, uh, for special recognition at the United Kingdom's National Television Awards, a ceremony that took place last night in London. Very uh, emotional. Uh, he thanked a lot of people, uh, especially his dad. Um, yeah, he's received a few awards, hasn't he? Yeah, right. that's the, the the special recognition is usually like their lifetime achievement award in a way. This is mm. his fifth one, his fifth really? MTA award. Yeah. Well, like I said, this is like the lifetime achievement award that they give somebody who's you know contributed a great deal to uh, film or in this case television. And the five. fact that Dennett's getting it so young mm -hmm. goes to show because he's had three highly successful series. In Britain. He had Casanova, yeah. mm -hmm. he had yeah, his yeah. run on Doctor Who, and mm -hmm. he's had Broadchurch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's not mm -hmm. including the TV dramas and stuff that he's been in as well. Right. I mean, like, you know, like the one-shot movies, except our short miniseries. Right. So, yeah. This is like one step down from being uh, declared a national treasure. He might actually be our first doctor to get knighted. Hmm. Uh, Wait. Uh, no. So, yeah, I was gonna say I the war doctor. Funny. Yeah. Technically, though, he was was he, no, he got knighted after his doctor appearance. Okay, I take that back. Mm-hmm. I just think I was, gonna say, I, was gonna, I was gonna say it hasn't been that long since he was knighted. Yeah, I thought he'd got knighted before he acted, though. So I was like, I was going to say that, and then I took it back. Yeah. But yeah, I was like. I'm wondering when interviewers are going to have to start calling him Sir David Tennant. Ugh. Of course, I'm also waiting for Sh Sir John Barrowman. Barrowman! Oh, I wouldn't mind that. All right. So anyway, you can see the full list of winners at the NTA website. I almost said TNA website, so. NTA That'd be interesting. Website. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. The doctor wins a TNA award. <laughs> yes. TNA okay. Impact. <laughs> That's a completely different reward, or a completely different award show, Aaron. It involves wrestling. <laughs> no oh, see, we were, yeah. Uh, we were we were taking different interpretations of TNA, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I was talking about Total Impact Wrestling. I don't know what that is. Oh, that's the um, that's the uh, uh, that's the uh, sequel or whatever you want to call it to uh, WCW wrestling. A lot of the uh, old WCW wrestlers are were in there. I don't know if they still are. Like Sting. Yeah, Hulk a Hogan. lot of them have. Kind yeah, of now left it's basically the... now Bischoff. that the WWE pretty much monopolizes wrestling. That's the new. That's the new Rebel Alliance in a way. Kinda. Or was I don't know. I don't, I don't yeah, know. I have All no idea. Are I, I think it's gotten relegated days. back to minor leagues. Anywho. Anyway, so, <laughs> moving on. Um, there is a campaign currently in progress to raise funds to publish a new book about K-9, the Doctor's robotic companion during the Fourth Era, and, of course, Sarah Jane's companion in the Sarah Jane Adventures in The Five Doctors. Mm -hmm. um, this initiative is being driven by the co-creator, Paul Tams, and will explore the... Canine's many lives through Doctor Who, Canine and Company, Sarah Jane Adventures, and his own series, the unofficial Australian series, Canine. Hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Tam says, 
It's amazing there's never been a book dedicated to the full story of K-9, his adventures in time and space and beyond, and the making of the TV shows in which he appeared. We aim to correct this oversight and present an amazing volume of features, photos, and behind-the-scenes information. We also aim to have several new stories and comic strips from classic writers, including his original co-creator, Bob Baker himself. This book will become a lasting tribute to the people who created, acted alongside, designed, and built K-9 throughout the years, and an insight into the world of TV production plus a look behind the scenes at plans for K-9's further adventures on screen. So, one of the, one of the by the sounds of it... be an audio book narrated by John Leeson. <laughs> <laughs> by the sounds of it, part of this is a money-raising plan to actually get production going on a second series of the K-9 TV series. Maybe. Which, as far as I understand, had been green-lighted, but has since hit development hell. Which is uh, a possibility. I think it's so weird. There's an unofficial series for K9. Well, the problem was that the BBC, uh, when K when the K9 series went into development, the BBC already had its hands full, Doctor Who wise, because it was at that time that Sarah Jane Adventures, Doctor Who, and Torchwood were all going simultaneously. And BBC didn't have money for a K9 series. Bob, Bob Baker, however, wanted to cash in on the character's reappearance in Doctor Who and uh, Sarah Jane Adventures. And do a spin-off series. Um, and he holds the actual intellectual rights to K9. Hmm. So hmm. Um, they basically, he went to uh, first the BBC who turned him down. And um, part of his thing is he couldn't go to another British <laughs> series. So he went to a Australian company who then sideways spun him off to Canada because it was an Australia-Canada co-production to make a series that technically can't reference the Doctor Who universe, yet um, uh, can't directly reference the Doctor Who universe, but still, uh, if you decide to... It's basically like Extended Universe for Doctor Who. So it's, 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 it's for K-9 what Probe was for Liz Shaw. Yeah. Hmm. Only... Closer to closer to canon than Probe was because Probe had to change names to protect the innocent. Mm -hmm. Um, and Probe, I mean, Probe Liz, was essentially they, Probe they was had, essentially they had unit. rights to a few people. They had Liz, and I think they had a few other rights, but I don't think they could get the Brigadier. Yeah, but Probe was essentially supposed to be Unit with a different name. Here, everything's changed except the character K9. There's nobody from the Doctor Who universe in there but K9. Mm. But technically speaking, that just considering it takes place in the future with different people, it, it doesn't mean that it can't not happen in the Doctor Who universe. Yeah, I'm kind of it's like certain that... writings in like the Star Wars extended universe or expanded universe, or a um, Star Trek pocket books novel. You know, mm -hmm. I'm kind of surprised that uh, Big Finish has not done a K9 series, have they? Not the they, uh, they've had K9 in series for yeah. instance Gallifrey. K9 mm -hmm. has been in there with the the first version with Romana, and um, I think K9 Mark II was in one ep one thing or another. There I was think, going I to think, be some. I think they're doing. Uh, I think they're doing stuff with uh, K9 Romana and uh, Tom Baker currently, but yeah, yeah, not 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 as a separate spin off or anything. Mm -hmm. Seems like they seem to do a spin-off of just about anything else. Mostly Maybe. mostly they do spin-offs of their own IP that it, yeah, that got popular within Doctor Who but that they that they own the rights to and the BBC doesn't. Like Char Charlotte Pollard is a big Finnish creation. Uh Bernice I don't think is a big Finnish creation but is a hell of a lot involved and they have a lot more rights to her than they do to uh, Doctor Bernie, Who. Mm -hmm. um, Bernie started in the, uh, I think, in the version novels uh, mm -hmm. as a seventh Doctor companion, became an eighth Doctor companion, uh, was supposed to be there, uh, basically have briefly missed the seventh to eighth regeneration, and um, then got spun off into her own series of books and now the radio dramas. Right? Like, if, if, if you look at how Big Finish talks about Bernie Summerfield, they basically treat her as the reason Big Finish came to be, which makes me think that they have full rights to her and that she was pretty much a large part of the founding um, of the company. I don't know about that's full pretty rights. false. That's pretty false. 
Is because, it really? No. Big, Sin Big Finish came into production because of Sirens of Time. That was their mm. first actual production. Um, yeah, but that was also that was also a one time, a one time thing that was quite a while before the actual Doctor Who main range got kicked off. Yes, but it was I, the selling that was the selling of Sirens of Time that got them to do this. Okay, I was just or thinking. I was just trying to point out the uh, the Gallifrey, the various Gallifrey series that are going on, and the Dalek series that were going on. Yeah, K nine is present in Gallifrey as uh as uh, President Romana's uh, there and Leela's both there. So actually, uh, both K there are two canines in the Gallifrey series. <laughs> and I actually think there has been at least one scene where K9 has been talking to K9. Fantastic. All they need is the third K9 from, from Sarah Jane. And yes, then you've got... that's it. what they really need. They do, except... An Liz army Lee of canines. <laughs> Army of Canines defending uh, Gallifrey. Actually, that, that mm -hmm. would be something for a special. Uh, Liz Sladen's, or uh, I mean uh, Sarah Jane's canine, goes off after her death and keeps solving mysteries or something and ends up on Gallifrey. Well, the Doctor Who universe has not actually acknowledged Sarah Jane's death, you notice. Mm -hmm. I mean, they acknowledged the Brigadiers. But the Sarah Jane adventures just stopped, and it's never come up in the, re in the mainline series. They've never tied. They've never closed that loose end. I thought there was a thing where Matt Smith, uh, in uh, like a, a character, said that Sarah Jane outlived uh, Elizabeth Sladen. Matt Smith may have said that in an interview, mm -hmm. but, but that, that was never canon. said in the show. Yeah. It's never. Mm. It's never been said uh, anywhere in the show, or anything. What happened? They just stopped production. Anyway, I think we've kind of covered this. Uh, Over, if you want more yeah. details on uh, on this, uh, you can go to Indiegogo's website. And there are a number of perks that can be chosen by those who participate in the campaign to create this book. Uh, details on the modern series of K9 can be found on its official website, <coughs> which is uh, www.k9official.com. Next. That's cool. All right, I believe I'm next. Yes, it uh, seems to be Tim next. My new story. In uh, Netflix news, Netflix is going to be doing a show based on the Marvel character Jessica Jones, and starring as uh, Jessica Jones is uh, one of her nemeses <laughs> will be David Tennant as Kilgrave the Purple Man. Okay. Mm. The Purple Man, uh, most people would know as a daredevil foe. Foe. He is a man with purple skin who has the power to uh, influence other people. Basically, he can make people do whatever he tells them to do. I think he was, and he I was think... kicked out of the Blue Man group in Ron's, in Ron's Revenge, right? <laughs> yeah. Um... Yeah. I believe there is yeah. some in comic history between the Purple Man and Jessica Jones, but yes, there is major uh, history. History, basically, if you've ever read uh, the Marvel Max series Alias, it follows the story of Jessica Jones, who is a private investigator and a former retired superhero. Yeah, if I remember correctly, her hero career didn't amount to much. Yes, and the she reason, an basically the reason she retired from superheroing in the first place was because her encounter with the Purple Man was so traumatic okay. that it uh, put her off uh, putting on a cape and tights. Probably for tights. a nice long while, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I've seen... Um, David Tennant played villain before, and not just Barty Crouch in Harry Potter. He did a couple of uh, um, made-for-TV movies in which he was kind of creepy stalker evil. Mm -hmm. He can pull it off. And God, this is a bad picture of Tennant. He looks really soulless in those pictures. I, I figure just well, looking at just looking at it, it sounds like soulless. soulless. He I looks think. like a round bird. 
It's it looks it it looks like they got his wax statue out of a museum and put him in a suit. His, one really of his does. eyes is askew. It's like they took Photoshop and tried jamming or spread, spreading his face out to make it look more plump. Yeah, it has like to be one cheek? of the most awkward shots anyone has ever gotten of him. <laughs> I, I'm just wondering if he'll, he'll have like uh, an accent because in the comic books, uh, Purple Man's origin was he was a Soviet spy. You don't. You don't want David Tennant. Well, I don't yeah. know. Maybe he could pull Soviet. Maybe. I know Maybe. trying to get him to do an American, American accent was was was, a, was a mixed bag. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't terrible, but it was obviously a British person doing. Yeah, it, it was. It was. It was muddled in in a lot of places. It was a Perry accent, really. Mm -hmm. Although um, I wonder if he could ever pull off anything further than Colonel Clink. So. I don't know. It depends on how he does the Soviet. Act. Remind you, you know, mm -hmm. being a Scotsman, and he managed to do a fairly good British accent. True. Oh yeah. Um, um, they're kind of, you know, just regional kind of differences, though. There. But yes, yeah, Soviet accent can be hard to do. So, it's a, it'll be interesting to see if Tennant can pull that off if he goes that way. It's a mm. diff It's a it's a different continuity. Mm -hmm. So they could drop that part of it, um, but if but if you're wondering whether he can do evil, creepy, yes, he can. Yeah, just from looking at school reunion and family of blood, I think there's enough of uh, David Tennant's portrayal there to kind of get what he would be like as a soulless evil character. Just just take what he does there and push it to the next degree. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I've mm -hmm. always wondered what would happen if Tenet had been at, if if Tenet had been handed the Nightmare and Silver plot where he had to do the uh, the planner, Mister Clever. Ooh, that would have been that, interesting. It, yeah, it would have been interesting, but I think at the end it would have been two David Tennants sternly staring at one another. I think. I don't. I don't know. I'm just. I'm just wondering. Cause, you know being able to pull one that's so incredibly darker. Right. I'm just I it's just interesting me whether he could have done that or not. Yeah. Well, other than that, interesting character, anyway, maybe yeah. he'll do something with it. In our, in our I'm big finish news it. this week, uh, there's not a lot of uh, Doctor Who releases, but there is a sale uh the Doctor Who main range uh I don't know what you call them, episodes, stories, whatever, numbers 51 through 100 are on sale right now. Uh, they say five pounds for either CD or download. I'm not, I've always wondered about this. I'm not sure whether it's an error or intentional, but if you actually go to them, it's five dollars for the download, five pounds for the CD, mm. uh, which uh, comes out to seven fifty five American. So again, I'm not sure if that's, if they meant five dollars for the download, five pounds for the CD. They always say five pounds for both, so I don't know, I but, uh, this, uh, these are stories starting right after the 40th anniversary special. Unfortunately, the 40th anniversary is not included, uh, but the 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 uh, 50 four, the 50 releases after it are. And you can get more information on that at BigFinish.com. I'm not going to try and spend time going through a list of all of them now. Mm -hmm. Too many. Now, I think Bill Big Finish is still tr realizing that they have an American audience. Um, because back when I first paid attention to Big Finish, it was bigfinish.co.uk for one, and there was no mention of American currency, period. <laughs> or maybe so they the are purposely selling it for only five bucks American. I don't know. Some places actually do do that. No, I think they are, but they, it's just their advertising hasn't caught up to that concept mm. yet. Maybe. Next. Okay. Well, that's actually the end of our news proper. And now we have one extended discussion topic. Um, this comes from the ABC, which is not uh, what we would call ABC. It's the Australian Broadcasting Company. Um, and uh, regards an interview that was made with Peter Davidson, who is down there to be the narrator in the Doctor Who Symphonic Spectacular. And 
his quote um, when asked if the next pilot of the TARDIS should be a woman is no. Um, he says in his in his uh, in his quotes, uh, "I speak now as a fan who grew up watching it. I have trouble with the idea of a female doctor." Only because I reckon if you're born on Gallifrey a man, you're probably a male Time Lord. Davidson said the key to the success of the modern Doctor Who series was the dynamic between a troubled Doctor and a strong female companion. It seems to me that if you reverse that, you have an uncertain, fallible female Doctor with a really strong male companion. You've got more of a stereotype than anything else. I'm don't really agree with this. I don't fully agree with that. Either. I, I yeah. see where he's coming from, but I also disagree. Yeah. And I, I, I do agree that if you took the 9th, 10th, and 11th Doctor's stories and tried to gender swap them, you could have some problems. Uh, but the whole thing place. is to continue telling new stories instead. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, Series 8, I don't think gender swapping them would have made the slightest bit of difference between Clara and the 12th Doctor. No. Yeah. Since... Both of them are a little well, other than um, what would have been the male Clara and Danny, but then you could have made it Denise Pink. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Actually, she would have. Actually, Danny Pink would have maybe worked better as a woman. I I don't think they would have kept a name Pink if it was a woman. Danny Blue. <laughs> maybe Denise. Denise. Well, actually, oh yeah, Blue. Denise Dan Blue. Danny like well, you D A N N I. Name her Danny. Yeah, Danielle. Mm. Mm -hmm. Danny with an oh, I. Wow. God, yeah. we're getting into we're getting into mm. yeah. We're getting Fan into fiction. Game of Thrones territory here. But no, the thing is, I don't feel. First of all, he he's of the opinion that you have to have a troubled, fallible doctor. Well, I think he's get he's he's basically I'm... saying that from 2005 through. I doubt he's watched series eight from 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 2005 through time of the doctor. That's basically what you have. You have the doctor going through various psychological issues or various similar issues to that, uh, which I agree that kind of plot would get questionable in a lot of people's hands if it was a female lead. But again, that's where writing new stories comes into play instead of writing the same story for another 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, it's definitely not should it should not happen right now, not while the person at the helm is Stephen Moffat. Yes, yeah. because he's only can write the same kind of stories. It would he would essentially make the Doctor into River Song. By, yes. by the way, did, did did we get to uh, Davison's other suggestion? No, I was I was saving that. I was Got saving you. that. Okay. Oh, we're saving that for, after after for later in the discussion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think maybe Moffat would be, uh, if anything, if we had a female doctor, he would probably make her somewhat like Missy, only less crazy. Like, I can the really only see him. More crazy. Yeah. <sighs> then maybe he would be, uh, like a river well, song, essentially. Well, it's, it's, yeah. it's pretty, t it's, it, Moffat has a hard time writing female characters. We've seen this. Yeah. We know this, yes. Yeah, so I don't think having the female as the lead is a good thing with somebody who can't write proper female characters. Right. That's the only reason I say no right now. Give us mm -hmm. somebody who can write female characters, and I'm absolutely fine with it. I'm pretty sure the the, the last time the uh, the, the Mafia wrote a female doctor, uh, she immediately uh, went off with the male master. Yes. Yes. But that was supposed to be a comedy. It was yeah. supposed to be a comedy, yes. So we will let that slide. Yeah, and this crack about the sonic screwdriver now having three settings. <laughs> that was not the best thing to take as a characterization. Nope. Because, after all, it was meant to be... Comedy. Deliberately cornball comedy. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But... It's not satire, it's crazy madcap humor. To be honest, I would love to see a female doctor written with with kind of Troughton's look in mind. Hmm. Look at me, I'm the ditzy female stereotype, but not really, I'm the genius calculating everything underneath it. Joe Grant is the doctor? Mm. Kind of, but mind kind you, of. more of, but 
Yeah, but more of <laughs> even more of that underlying calculating, you know. I mean, if you take a look at um, not this episode, but the episode before that we reviewed last week. Um, oh, two uh, of the Cybermen. No, not even that one. The week before uh, that, moon uh, the moon, moon base. base. Moon base. Yes. Yes, yes, that one you really saw Troughton just going... Just plotting. Yes. I would love to see... Um, I would love to see uh, a female doctor with the air of, you know, uh, of acting like a stereotype up front, but with that chess master underneath. Yeah, as soon as the other people that don't really know her step out of the room, she That'd takes cool. turns to her companions and she's already plotting. Yes. And sends them on their way. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. here's what's going on, and here's what we need to do. She I just, you know, knows that if she acts like, you know, a stereotype, people will dismiss her. It's like Troughton acting like a clown. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, it kind of reminds me... I, I remember thinking of kind of similarities between um, Ace and uh, Christopher Eccleston's Doctor... There's kind of a similar Kinda. badass, you know, I'm a wounded, you know, rebel type deal. Mm-hmm. To, mm -hmm. to those two characterizations, so. Kind of, sort of, yeah. Uh, is that it? Here's well, a question, no. and this, uh, this is something Aaron had broached when we were discussing it beforehand. What kind of companion we would want with such a doctor? Oh, well, mm. there could be interesting mm. ones. Like, I was just thinking of the nerdy guy, like, Nigma from Gotham. I don't know. Nigma is a little bit creepy wrong. Um, yeah, either but that be or more harmless. Well, it's or, saying like, w would the female doctor ha automatically have a male companion? Well, yeah, that's true. Know. You could have a female doctor and a female companion. Yes, but mm. then you go into Xena territory. Well, you get the mother daughter I, I, treatment I, I, though. I, I, I was more thinking Legend of Korra myself. I don't know anything about. Legend I I, I of haven't Korra, seen really. any Legend of Korra since nope. the first season. I, I I royally need to catch up on that. I but, hear it's good, but beyond well, that, it's all for my in, head. In, in order to explain what I mean, do you mind if I spoil something that's not plot related? Go I ahead. Should probably announce any spoilers to our viewers. If, if it's not plot related, we shall yeah. start with spoilers in five. <laughs> and if four, it, if it's a season two three, spoiler, then. Two. Uh, one. I don't care about spoilers, but it, bas basically just... through basically throughout seasons three and four of Legend and Korra, the creators were dropping very subtle uh, to the point where I in, well di honestly didn't believe them at first. Essentially, hints toward a relationship between uh, Korra and uh, her female friend, who had sort of been swept up as part of the team and become along for the ride. Uh, mm -hmm. As in 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 the finale, they essentially announced them as a couple. Yeah. Oh, so they're I've sort of like that. building up through that throughout the entire thing. That's kind of what I was referring to. In fact, the creators actually. Oh god! Actually they pulled made... a willow with a with the character. Well, the the creators actually, you know, made an an even an ex an extra post I think on their website about how yes, this is this was a, re a relationship yeah. that we've been look, working up to. But I'm I'm trying to say that uh, two women on the TARDIS doesn't necessarily need. No, that's that's no, that's, exactly. that's no, true. but that's so. that's tends to be how it, how that kind of pair up gets written on television. Uh, because it's you know sex makes money. Yeah. I would make some sort of comment about Minx and Prism, but I won't. I still like watching and, RPG Minx. Anyway, although I, I guess it also depends, you know, if this is going to be something, you know, if this is. I mean, the the idea of doing that obviously comes, you know, from looking at like the David Tennant age doctor. But if you know, if you do, you could always do an older or a younger. All, I mean, we've had a few young doctors, so I mean, obviously they probably wouldn't do something like that if they had a fifty year old. Oh shoot, are there any of the Golden Girls still around? Because that would be an interesting doctor. The only one oh God, that's Betty still White. around is Betty White. <laughs> oh, is Betty White is the doctor. Oh my God, that would be awesome. That would, she, she would be hilarious. Wrong. <laughs> no, I would. I would pay money to see this. She's a foul mouth lady. Yes. <laughs> have, have you heard uh, Peter Capaldi before we came to Doctor? <laughs> <laughs> it would almost be the same role. Only if you woman. could imagine it. 
as somebody coming up to you and acting like the like you'd expect your granny to act and then say something to make your jaw drop through the floor. It would be fantastic. I love Betty White as an actress. She's still fantastic these days. Anywho. Actually, anyway. would be a very interesting doctor. <laughs> so, um, Davidson's other suggestion is saying that the time is right for a new female Time Lord to have a spin-off series, and laughingly suggested that as Georgia Moffat might be good for the role, a.k.a. getting Jenny her own series, which, you know, sounds a little nepotistic a... to me. Yeah. But it's also something that the fans have been asking for for how long now? Yes, it is. But hasn't, yeah. Georgia, hasn't Georgia been a little busy, you know, making babies with mm -hmm. David Tennant? Yeah, yes, but much. she could also use a break. Well, <laughs> That's that, really that was... up to her and David, isn't it? I wasn't kind of. really entirely impressed with Georgia Moffat's performance either. I didn't really, you know... Well, I didn't find her terrible. She was all right for someone who was playing a newborn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, I think we kind of melt this article, have we not? I think I so. I think there's not much else to say about it. How much um, more time do we have to kill? We're good. We 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 can go into the summary now, ish. Yeah. Unless um, someone has something they want to talk about regarding that. Um, not much. It's just you know. Peter Davidson's statements come off as being a bit old-fashioned. A mm. little bit, yes. True. It's and hard to Yeah. What, what, what were you going to say? I, I, I said, uh, I'm trying to say that I, I can't hate him. I mean, he, no, he's Oh, I can't hate him either, either no. I, you know, it, it's it's very like hard to like... talk about sensitive matters like this without ruffling a few feathers, no matter what, anyway. Mm -hmm. And he does his best to work his way around it and be more polite about it. Mm-hmm. So... You can't fault him. Nobody's perfect. I still like him as the doctor. Yes. Mm. And we also have his dead ringer as a fellow uh, um, convention worker. So. Yeah. You. I don't think there's any of the doctors you can actually outright hate. No. Not even Colin Baker. <laughs> who is admittedly yeah. a bit of a troll, but you know. But he's a troll I mean, in the I fun feel, way. I feel, right. like if, I feel like if I met William Hartnell on the wrong day, I would walk away. Yes, but you can't because he's dead. <laughs> Sourly. No, yes, true. Sure. If you're talking about the living ones, then that's a different story. Mm -hmm. Well, it depends upon how even, you approach Even them, though, Hartnell too. tended, when he was in public and talking to the public, to put on a very good face about everything. Mm hmm. So yeah, he became very much the grandfather figure he became in later seasons. Yeah, so it was um, it was basically unless you were of course cast in the in the acting with him, in which case he was occasionally a bit of a bastard. Um, so no, I don't think there's any doctors I can outright hate. Yeah, living or dead. Not even Peter Cushing, who I I to this day would have mm. loved to meet. Oh, and I, I, I still I still can't look at him without thinking of Grand Moff Tarkin. Right. True. And I'm not even the big Star Wars fan in the group. It was his big role before he died. What can we say? But, yeah, I just find that, that his particular view to be old-fashioned. It's, it's a little old-fashioned, yeah. Anyway, we're still beating on this, so are we ready so, to move on? So, moving on to the summary... Who wants to do the summary? Do we have a volunteer? <laughs> Crickets are chirping. As a matter of fact, I hear static in the background. Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? Anybody? <laughs> I okay. could take this if you really want me to. Is is? It, I, I feel like you use that joke at least once a week at this point. I Almost. do, yeah, because much. I always hit the same point, who wants to do the summary, and that's my default for when I do the summary, for when I ask that kind of question and get no answer. Mueller. Okay, so, the episode starts out with the Doctor and Jamie basically waving goodbye to Victoria on a screen as they're leaving her behind at the end of the previous, um, um, not episode, not... Cereal? I'm pulling a Fitz, Aaron. Um, <laughs> cereal. Story. The 
previous mm-hmm. series. Well, it, it, I, it, I just it was the previous episode. Fury from the Deep. It was the last episode yeah, of yeah, the previous the story, wasn't it? Deep. Um, so, after a bit of, of, hand, of, of waving and Jamie uh, agonizing about leaving her behind, they take off and the TARDIS lands, and they're not sure where. First, it seems to be a lot of metal, and then, looking up the scanner, they start seeing various locations that look nice and enticing. Beaches, um, nice veldts, grassy plains, etc. But Jamie notices that first it's day, then it's night, then it's day again, and the doctor realizes that the TARDIS is showing places that it'd rather be than right here. <laughs> the doctor um, rethinks that, starts to uh, plan to take off, but our old friend, the fluid link, decides to crack open again and start venting mercury into the console room. The doctor and Jamie are struggling to get out, and the doctor pulls open one of the roundels and pulls out a golden rod, and Jamie and Basically, he and Jamie quickly escaped the TARDIS. The introduction of the magic wand to Doctor Who. Yeah, well before 2005. Of. Well, technically, Fury from the Deep introduced the sonic screwdriver in the previous serial, but neither here nor there. True. Um, they find themselves into uh, what looks to be a spaceship of some kind, but uh, oddly enough, seems to be a bit distur- deserted. Um, looking down on the floor, uh, the doctor spies a series of tracks looking like they were made by a machine. Um, of what kind, they don't know. So, they proceed to go through, they find this, and they find quarters, and a sealed door in front of them. Uh, searching through the ship, they don't find a hell of a lot else. The doctor and Jamie go to the corridor, because Jamie is hungry. Because he's Jamie. So they pull out some water, they pull out a small piece and discuss what to do. Meanwhile, in the pilot ship, we see a small squat robot who's not R2-D2. He meanders out, checks the previous corridor where they were, eventually wanders back and checks on the, and discovers the TARDIS before going back forward into the into the cockpit. Having their repost and a bit light, and a bit of a lie down, uh, the doctor gets up and wanders outside while Jamie continues to rest and notices the fact that there's now a third track on the on the runway, meaning the robot had gone past before. At this point, the robot makes a course correction. The doctor bangs his head against the door, and Jamie gets rolled out of bed. The spaceship is approaching a station, which does not seem to recognize the fact that the ship is there. Um or does not seem to recognize, or doesn't seem, not. it recognizes that the ship is there, it doesn't seem to know, it, it's not supposed to be there. So they're deciding what to do, while the uh, ship launches a series of round, egg-like objects. They decide to uh, fire this huge X-ray laser at the ship, and as they're prepping to do so, Jamie finds the doctor, who is uh, in a bit of an odd state, being terrorized by this metal robot. Jamie throws a blanket over the robot, seems to knock it out of commission, and the doctor collapses in, uh, back in the uh, quarters. Jamie, thinking fast, amazingly for Jamie, uh, grabs the, the metal rod that the doctor took from the TARDIS, which seems to light up at one end, and st- sticks it uh, in a porthole and starts flashing it at the station. This causes feedback over the headsets, uh, causing issues for a few people, but the people that don't realize that there's a signal in it. So they send people over to the station, or to the ship, and bring back the doctor and Jamie. The doctor has a mild to severe concussion, and Jamie, aside from a few bumps and bruises, is more or less all right. Since the doctor's indisposed, Jamie takes the brunt of the interview. Uh, when asked who he is, he answers freely, but when, how did they get on the ship and what happened to the crew? He makes up a story that he doesn't know because he was suffering from space fever. And when asked the name of his companion, 
uh, looks at a medical supply box and comes up with the name John Smith, a name that would continue to plague the doctor for the rest of his remaining lives. <laughs> yes, it does. Meanwhile, um, these eggs um, start to basically glow and hatch, revealing that they are, in fact, the doctor's old enemies, the Cybermen. Um, invading the station has been our uh, more recent cyber enemies, the Cyber Mats, which has gotten on board. Jamie, hearing that they are still about to blow up the, uh, the ship, which contains the TARDIS, wanders off and sabotages uh, the laser, the x-ray lasers, and while it's being repaired, the Cyberman, the Cybermat eats all the fuel. Jamie has also met Zoe, a young librarian, uh, who, no, who has a great deal of facts and figures and has been checked to uh, covertly spy on Jamie as uh, they know that he's been lying. Uh, Jamie is caught sabotaging and is put under uh, lock and key along with the doctor. Um, in the um, the weapons room, they are attempting to repair the laser, but one of the maintenance guys finds himself surrounded by the Cybermats. Um, thinking quickly, he takes a canister of liquid plastic, which Jamie had used earlier to sabotage the laser and sprays it on one of these devices. Um, they take it... Uh, Zoe takes an interest in it, takes it back to the doctor and Jamie, who decide to x-ray it. Meanwhile, while this has been going on, the station director has basically been uh, showing signs of PTSD and has started to reject the reality around him. Um acting first with anger and fury that things aren't going on normally, and then acting like nothing's wrong at all. Uh, the Cybermen also have taken control of uh, two people uh, sent across to investigate the ship for anything they might need, and they, the Cybermen, are smuggled on board inside a case of these fuel rods. Around the same time, in a nearby section of the galaxy, uh, a local cluster, uh, Star has gone supernova, which has sent a whole bunch of asteroids heading towards the station, more than their shields can handle. Without the rate laser, they're going to be toast. The shields can't withstand Ooh. asteroids of that magnitude. Pretty much. Um, I had to, I'm sorry. I think they actually said that in the episode. I think they might have. Mm. Anyway, so they... Uh, so the Cybermen are on the ship. The Cybermat has been identified by the Doctor and Jamie, who basically have their oh shit moment. But knowing it's the Cybermen, they know more or less what the Cybermen are going to plan. They know they're going to get on the ship, and when they do, they start, they start planning for the eventual situation. Um, the Cybermen actually want the laser fixed. So they mind control the, the laser repair crew to get them to work on it. Um, and their secondary plan is to shut down the oxygen on the station, killing all the humans. Um, but before they can do that, uh, first of all, uh, Jamie and uh, the doctor needs the gold rod that he took from the TARDIS, which anybody remembers the exact name for that? Is it the inanimate carbon uh, rod? The temporal something. Yes. Temporal something, um, yeah. I can't remember the exact name of it. Yeah, I had this page up on the wiki earlier and then turned and then unplugged it when we uh, had the news going. Stupid me. Um, silly, silly, Randy. But anyway, he needs this rod because it's essential for his plan to defeat the Cybermen. So Jamie and Zoe suit up and go tumbling across space to deal with it. Meanwhile, the second in command of the station discovers the Cybermen's plan to, rem plan to remove the oxygen and um, dies in the process. Um, the laser's back online, and Jamie and Zoe have a bit of a shaky trip back to the station, but Jamie soon finds the rod and return it. But one of the other people who the Cybermen have mind-controlled 
identifies uh, pictures of the people currently on the ship, and the Cybermen recognize the Doctor from his previous adventures with them. The Cyber Planner, which looks to be a round spherical object with the voice of the old Cyber Controller, mm -hmm. um, hatches a plan to get the Doctor isolated and deal with him. But the Doctor realizes that their plan to get him isolated is in fact a plan to get him isolated and takes other measures to deal with it. Uh, he builds a small force field in the in the chamber, which manages to take care of one of the Cybermen and prevent the other one from harming him. And Jamie shows up with the rod before uh, they can get any further. The Doctor inserts the rod into the gun, which manages to take out the attack the cyber ship, which was on its way to attack Earth. All of this was revealed within the course of a few minutes. Uh, a small team manages to take of uh, reclaimed people because apparently putting a metal rod or a metal piece on the back of your neck prevents cyber control. Go fig. Manages to take out the remaining Cybermen on the shop. The invading Cybermen masses along for the force field to fling them into space. Resting in the victory and regaining control of the station, uh, the Doctor and Jamie prepare to take off. Uh, but Zoe uh, wants to know more about them and manages to stow away on the ship. The Doctor, realize, uh, finding her before they take off, basically gets to show her what they would, uh, the kind of things they would be facing and shows her some of the Daleks at the end of the episode. Oh, okay, I got that summary done fairly quickly. Yes. As quickly as you could. Yes. For well some done. reason, the name of that device is in neither the Wheel in Space article nor the Silver Carrier article. Hmm. Mm. Apparently, TARDIS does not want us to know what it's called. The MacGuffin. The Unless MacGuffin. It's in my because, because it has... Yeah, it I, has... I, 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 called it, I called it the MacGuffin device. The because, Golden MacGuffin. Yeah, it's, never seen, it's never been seen before, and it is never seen again. Unlike the Fluid because... Link, which earns its name by breaking every 15 serials or so. Well, the MacGuffin is Scottish in origin. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's a device used to capture lions in the Scottish Highlands. Alright. Well, <laughs> the main problem for, my, for this episode for me is telesnaps, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. as, as you guys may know, um, not talking to the, the panel, but to anybody listening... Uh, this is a lost episode of Doctor Who. Yes. Only episodes yep. three and six exist currently in the BBC's records. So that means that um, as, since they've never done an animated reconstruction of one, two, four, and five, um, the rest of it has been um, partially regained by photo by still photo still photography taken uh, by people at the time and reuse of a few scenes. Uh, the episode that we watched had also been partially animated using, I, I think, Movie Maker or something. I want to say it was probably somebody's fan project using some sort of usual 3D uh, program. It looked, the animation yeah, reminded me a lot. Yeah, program, so I put some work into it. Yeah, uh, the animation reminded me of... Um, some of the early DVD releases that we had for Doctor Who, where you would get these uh, little enhanced special effects scenes. Hmm. Um, so, so yeah. So it maybe was it was a test animation by the same group. I don't know. Uh, no, no, these were these were fan submissions. So po quite possibly too. So it was definitely some fan work with a popular um, modeling software. Um, of some basically, kind, yeah. they did the they mostly did scenes where there wasn't a physical person. Just like a robot or asteroids, although asteroids could have been redone and done better. Um, Actually, I think and, the asteroids were borrowed from actual clips from the episode. Yeah, actually. they were. Um, and um, I, I thought it was kind was of jarring. Once... I'm sorry, uh, jarring yeah. when they would switch from like uh, the still photographs to like brief like CGI animation. Um, it doesn't bother me so much because I've been watching um, Star Trek, the original series, in their uh, – basically what was their uh, high-definition remasters where they redid all the old special effects with modern CGI. Oh, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And remember, to be not, honest, not knowing that they had made that, it really threw me off when I watched uh, Star Trek on Netflix and I'm seeing these CGI enterprises. I was like, what? Yeah. But once you know that's going to happen, um, some of those episodes of Star Trek Redone look absolutely beautiful. The Doomsday Machine with mm. new special effects is a wonderful episode to watch. Because that, that episode was like 50 to 60% special effects shots. Yeah. Uh, and... I would also argue for a uh, whole bunch of episodes that are mostly going to be still images or a few cuts from either previous episodes in the story or uh, little tidbits from, like, uh, say, um, Blue Peter. Having at least some sort of animated thing for the really quiet moments is a breath of fresh air, to be honest. Yeah, but at yeah. the same time, there's still a lot of stuff that's telesnaps and the dialogue of what go- what's going on scrolling below the telesnaps. Once in a while, and to- yes. And to be mm-hmm. honest, when that happens... My attention starts to wane. I mean, to, I was already half falling asleep from eating a big dinner when I was watching this. I started so, drifting off mm-hmm. about midway through the fifth episode. I think I started on the fourth. <laughs> I, I, I paid full attention when it was definitely the live action episodes, but I did tend to uh, waver to looking at other things while listening to the Telesnap stuff. Although yeah, I did try that, to pay and that's the main problem with telesnaps. With Big Finish mm-hmm. Audio, you can do that because it's meant to be just listened to. Mm-hmm. And they but pre-plant that fair. way. Yes, but with with this, there's whole scenes where you're just not sure what's going on. So when and... it got quiet, I kind of knew that they were trying to pull something, usually with this one at least, so I would come back and go, oh, look, animated again. Yeah, you, usually when there's not a lot of dialogue is when there's the scrolling text across the screen, so you can at least... Mm-hmm. No, then, which is actually the same way with a lot of even more modern things that are intent, you know, that are are that are, don't have that problem where you know you can realize okay when the, when the dialogue is quiet, there's probably something visual on the screen that you can't miss, and that's when you turn your head to make sure you're paying attention. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so telesnaps will always get a little bit of a point deduction for me. Because I do start losing some attention level like that, so I'm going to so I'm going to let you all take that as a grain of salt as we go into what we usually do with these episodes, what you liked, what you didn't like, scenes we liked, scenes we didn't like. Um, let's start with uh, who's on my list. Who's on, who's on the list? First? That's... Who's on first? What's on second? And we start with Matt. Starting with me again. So, well, I, I think that I think this is essentially the same call as we had last week, so everybody's <laughs> still in the same picture location. Yeah, I think we should try starting a new call. <laughs> um, Randomize people. And mind you, I don't know, you may always be first, because you're technically in charge of the calls. Technically. Um, I... I, I could, say, I could uh, you know, start bringing a D4 to the podcast and rolling it. Could. Um, I will say uh, one of the things I like... What's someone saying? I always again? go last because I'm looking at four pictures. <clears throat> uh, I will Roll say... Well, <laughs> shut up, please. <laughs> I'm trying to talk, and you keep interrupting me just as I'm about oh, to so talk you, every you time. You didn't here. talk for a while, so I said something. <sighs> I could hear for the fifth on the time, if you don't mind, please. Uh, one of the things I think that uh, got nicely upgraded was the Cybermen overall. I can tell these are new bodysuits. Uh, they look a little more like the next model that we're going to get uh, in the next story. The teardrops fact. are there. The teardrops have been added onto the eyes. They also have the little teardroppy bump on the bottom lip. Uh, the suits, again, the main body suits themselves have been upgraded. I think they have. The wiffle uh, balls are gone. Better glo- gloves. What is that? The wiffle balls are gone. The wiffle balls are gone, yes. So there's less I paid a weird close things attention attached to them. To them. Um, I believe these are still the same helmets as last time, but again, they added a little extra de- decals on them, so that kind of works, and it's getting a little closer to the iconic look. Um, they seem to move around a little more naturally this time, 
um, I think so as well. Um, again, these seem to be better body fitted suits. Mm -hmm. Although it was kind of um, hard to tell in some areas because tell snaps. Because tell snaps, but the the two episodes we got of them, they definitely seemed to be very comfortable with what they were doing. Matter of fact, they even got a lift a guy live on screen. Unfortunately, since there's been no DVD release of the Wheel in Space, we don't get to hear interview with people on what it was like in these particular suits. Yeah, that's the one I, thing I, I was kind of looking for, and I couldn't find anything. Um, I can guess that there were still some issues. Oh, probably because of because of the need for another revolution in the invasion. Uh, well, the helmets in particular, I would think, are the biggest problem of the suits still because they still have these are more or less the same helmets as far back as Moonbase. So they More probably have problems. They still probably have problems for heads inside of those helmets. And also, looking at those helmets, you realize that they have a solid structure down to the neck, onto their shoulders. So you couldn't really turn their head around very well either. Yeah, you can actually see the. Uh, um, I noticed this because I was also looking at the cyber suits. Mm -hmm. You can see where the helmet is placing on the on the suit. You know. Over the over the over the jumpsuit, if you will. Yeah. And I know that later production Cybermen go very strong into finding a way to hide that. Yeah. Especially the eighty Cybermen really. Oh, definitely. Had the suit actually come up over the helmet piece. Um, trying to think. Oh, they also changed up the voice. I think in most sequences, not all sequences, but most sequences, the new Cyberman voice is a little bit better to hear. It was, but at the same time, it wasn't very um mechanical sounding um, no, the, one, the, the, voice, mechanical sound. the voice that they did and I'm going to go ahead and say this Matt because this is something that kind of annoyed me is there was one scene where they changed the voices and it kind of became a hybrid of what they were sounding like and what the cyber planner sounded like and I thought those are pretty good and then they redid that same scene for the next week and they went back to the other voices and I'm like oh my one problem with the voices were they were a little too close to Daleks. Mm, so so. But anyway, that was. Uh, of my course, overall... that also could be that one of the cyber voices was Roy Skelton, who is well known as being a Dalek voyeur. Could have been, yes. But yeah, that's my general, uh, no really noticeable improvement. I think uh, thing I liked about this episode. Okay, Tim. All right. Uh... One thing I liked about the episode was the uh, the interplay between Jamie, the Doctor, and Zoe. Hmm. Zoe, it uh, like sort of like a, was a good setup for um, like the the, the new uh, the new team, so to speak. It was a good introduction to that, as well as. Uh, it, I liked how it gave Jamie more things to do than just lying unconscious on a bed. No, it was the doctor's turn to do that. <laughs> yeah. For an episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, like, uh, it also was more realistic, like, how someone from the 18th century would uh, sort of have to think on his feet without uh, the doctor to explain everything to him. And, like, and that idea of him, like, coming up with the name... John Smith, just by reading it. And also him, like, figuring out how to signal the uh, wheel with uh, the golden rod. I don't know. That one hit me as being... I, I, I was kind of wondering how the hell Jamie came up with that, to be honest. Yeah, I'm not well, entirely sure on that either. Well, oh, I, I think his idea was that he was going to... Like uh, it was glowing, and we can like like sort of signal it like with like a light in the window. Maybe, and it and happened. Again, it he, happened to work, but not in the way like he thought it would. Fires and smoke signals, I think. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's basically along the same train of thought. Yeah. So he happened to just mm -hmm. get really lucky that it, uh, instead of mm -hmm. seeing a light, they heard the dis uh, a weird signal. So I think it's Although just pure I, I luck. I do think that someone who is a secret agent for an episode could do a little better than John Smith. But Well, you know, it could have been worse. Imagine if it was real world items, if Jamie had been looking at a bottle of maximum strength, etc. The doctor could have been plagued for the, for the rest of his existence with the name Max Cedron. <laughs> <laughs> Mm 
Mm, I... <laughs> but some, but I know, cause I'm Max. <laughs> Better than Max Headroom. <laughs> Boom. Okay, so was that everything, Tim? That was everything. Yeah. All right, Bill. I'm going to go with Zoe's uh, character arc here. Uh, Zoe starts off as very much someone you would think would either be Cyberman-like or almost on the Cyberman side to the point of heavily favoring facts and logic over everything else. And then throughout the course of the episode, she starts to, you know, realize the flaws in that and the growth that she still needs and to, you know, to become interested in learning more rather than just becoming smug with the knowledge she already has Mm -hmm. and goes on to become someone who would become, you know, would be interesting as a companion. So it's, it's, I just enjoyed, you know, seeing, seeing Zoe's character arc from the, from, from the, you know, her librarian role in the beginning to, uh, to someone who wants to go with the doctor and learn his way of life, essentially. From an observer to a participant. Mm-hmm. True. You know, I mentioned before the podcast I was going to say something so I could get your actual reaction to it. I'm going to say it here. Do you know who what Zoe's personal who Zoe's personality reminds me of? Mm. Hermione Granger. Hmm. Yeah. It's fair. From the first book, yeah. Very uh, fair. From the first book towards the end, yeah. Yeah. She gets to be a Except less she's performing. never quite as haughty as Hermione is in uh in her yeah. first year. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I don't think she has as big an ego. Which is interesting because a character like Zoe, you'd think would, and you can tell they were grooming her for a companion by the fact that she didn't because normally. I mean, especially if she was right now as a character with those traits, would definitely have been very egotistical. There, there is a little bit superior. of that. If, if there is a little bit of that, if you look closely at the dialogue, there's several situations where the doctor comes up with something, and she's like, "Why there's didn't I bit? think of that?" But yeah, well, at least but I that, thought that, of it before it you did, pointing to Jamie. Right, <laughs> but that's. Just, I mean, in her situation, I would be. Th- I might not say it, but I would be thinking it. So I can definitely, you know, see where she's coming from there. Of course, there's also Jamie's, you know, Jamie definitely does not like her being smarter than him anyway because he likes to make his own little snide comments too. So Mm -hmm. she's just, you know, giving as well as she's getting. This is, it's actually, the um, not to give away spoilers for later seasons, but we're only going to be covering one more episode in their arc, and we have seen them before when we did the War Games a while back. Yes. Uh, but the way that Jamie and Zoe kind of develop into is they're one of the first real snarky relationships I can remember on television. <laughs> kind of. They just kind of snar- snipe and snark at each other um, throughout. Yeah, Ben and Polly had a little of that, but not as much. No. Oh. But you kind Jamie of get this, to... this feeling even through the snidiness that they're just kind of like poking fun more so mm-hmm. than actual head bashing. Yeah, I'm not saying it's 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 foul intention snark. Most mm-hmm. of my I snark all the time. None of it has any real bite right. to it. Well, that's I that's just... just that's just like how how they how they met each other was a snarky situation where she's trying to guess where he's from, and he's you know like you know. Well, I'll t- you know, I'll take you over my knee if you call me Norwegian again or whatever she thought to- thought he was. A Dane. And she called him a Dane. Yeah, a Dane. There we go. <laughs> and her response is to laugh at that. Yeah. Well, mind you, also, I come from a I come a fa- from a family who that's how we function. My mother and I have basically snarked at each other our entire lives, but. You know, it's for us. It's a good thing. It's how we show we care. And those two, I, it's 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 uh, it's one of those relationship things that would actually become a trope. Yeah. It would be Sam and Diane and Cheers. Uh, 
uh, Bruce Willis and Sybil Shepherd in Moonlighting. Mm -hmm. It's it really is actual. It's it's a it's a romantic comedy trope of the two people that just like sniping at each other, falling for each other. So, and you you get an inkling of that. And, oh, but of course, it don't, never comes. Don't to mention how many different their... countless animes have that as well as the main for the main characters too. Yeah, that too. And of course, it never goes anywhere because this was a children's show, and they all get their minds erased in the end of the war games. If you say so. So. There's fan debate on even that. Yeah. Well, eventually it happens. Whether it happens well, at the end of the war games or Zelda after a, another, yeah. Either way, um, it ha um, nothing ever comes comes of that particular i that particular relationship. And like I said, it is kind of obvious too that Jamie was sweet on Victoria, but yeah. he got to play the big strong man to Victoria's. Victorian sensibilities. Mm hmm. So that yeah, it is kind of a strong relationship. So yeah, I can see that, Bill. Okay, Aaron, what did you like about the episode? Um, I actually liked the concept that was brought up that I thought was interesting. I'm not sure if they actually followed through with it in, in subsequent um, serials. It was the Earth for Earth movement. They do. They do follow they do. up on that a little yeah. bit, yes. It, the, Earth, mm -hmm. the Earth for Earth movement comes back. Um, in both the third and fourth Doctor eras, though by the fourth, fourth Doctor era it had a name change, of like the Brotherhood of Humanity or the Brotherhood of Mother Earth or something like that. Something along those lines, yeah. Um, of the of the belief that mankind's destiny is not in space but back home in Earth. Yeah. Um, then the oh no, it's the Sons of Earth. I'm going to guess that they all got both. Um, it's the Sons of Earth. Um, you hear it um, again during the Third Doctor era. I actually looked this up before the episode because I actually hoped it would come up. Thank you, Aaron. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Um, it comes up in the Third Doctor era as as a, a actual a actual factual terrorist faction. Um, they they've done terrorist things in space and caused a great deal of trouble, and then um, the uh, Sons of Earth seems to be slightly more um, undergroundish. Um, they were uh, supposedly running guns to the Swampies in Kroll to convince the people to have them overthrow the people running the uh, methane factory mm -hmm. to get them to go back home to Earth. Okay. Yeah, so I just it is. Thought, a, you know... It's a theme that keeps coming back, at least until the Fourth Doctor era. But I think John Nathan Turner's era kind of changed the way uh, they oh. thought about how space was into the more gritty, uh, semi-dystopian future anyway. Mm -hmm. So they so kind of got that dropped out to the wayside. kind of got dropped, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, this kind of introduced it. It was just kind of an interesting concept because, you know, you have the Doctor going on all these fantastic space-based adventures and everything, and here's this group of people who are completely the opposite of that. And it just it sounded like it would be if they had explored it a little bit deeper or something around that era. I was kind of curious. It would have been more interesting. Actually, it would be kind of interesting to bring it back as a semi-background villain for a season or something. Yeah, that would be this group cool. of people that start to notice this chain of events, dealing with this one person known as the Doctor throughout time. Considering that we are in the 21st century now, so it is right around the time for them to crop up. Mm-hmm. All right. So, what I liked about this episode... Um, give me a moment here, because I have to make sure I don't say anything that you guys said. Um, hmm... Um, I liked the fact that they actually did touch on, you know, it, it like they followed through off the last serial again. Yeah. Um, and I think I mentioned this with the last episode. I think it was with Tomb. Mm-hmm. Um, they followed through with uh, 
um, the last serial where they introduced Victoria here, they followed through with saying goodbye to her. Jamie was all bummed out, and every now and then you'd stop and go, you know, you know, I wonder what Victoria's doing now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, 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 the doctor is trying not to say, oh, Victoria died hundreds of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, the doctor didn't know because mm-hmm. he didn't know when he was. Well, I True, think but he, that's right. he, he's, he's, he's like, what do you think Victoria's doing now? Uh, well, time is relative, Jamie. <laughs> but yeah, in real time, after you find the wheel in space that came from Earth, she's probably been long perished in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, that's actually a good point of why the doctor never looks back either. Mm-hmm. Because yes, you're going to some place where they're either been dead or hadn't been born yet. But still, for somebody who had somebody that they were kind of sweet on, that kind of uh, you know, that kind of moping is rather usual. And then of course he gets the rebound of Zoe of of Zoe in his face. Mm-hmm. Which she doesn't initially take to, but they seem to grow on each other pretty quickly, even in this story. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. when, when Jamie got over being pissed off that Zoe wasn't Victoria. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, considering the fact that um, uh, it was the 60s at the time, and, and Zoe and... Uh, they they had Zoe tend to be fond of of wearing cat suits. Hey. Ah, uh, 1960s. Sparkly fans. cat suits. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um. That's okay. The, so, what anything. didn't you like? And I believe we've covered telesnaps. So. Sort of. Yes. Starting with you, Matt. Ah, <sighs> something I didn't like. Um. Anything that really nagged me about this one, um, other than tr- the lack of background information because this isn't on a DVD yet, um, I'm trying to think, anything that I think one of my one of the things that had me puzzled was how they had this mind control beam all of a sudden when that wasn't a thing at all ever. It, it sort of degraded. It went from, we need to take you to Mondash to convert you, to we'll stick a thing on your head to convert you, to we need to hypnotize you. It, yeah, it seems kind of weak. And yeah, out of nowhere. it was a little bit out there. And that, that's one, yeah, that's one thing. I think it continues through the invasion, and then I think they lose that power because it makes no sense. Mm-hmm. Actually, I don't think they have it in the invasion, do they? They have it in the invasion. They use it once that I know of. Yeah, and that probably only because they really needed to use it just uh, once. It's and the power of plot. And except, yeah. except in the invasion, you can see it starting to fail, too. So. Okay. Or are you talking about the emotion machine? I'm talking about uh, the Major General. Hmm. We'll, we'll have to discuss that later after we watch it again. We'll have to watch, discuss it next week. Yep. Yeah. All right. So is there anything else, Matt? Um, I think that was my ma- my major uh, thing that was added in on this story that didn't make any logical sense to me, really. Okay. Tim? Oh my god. Uh, the character of Jarvis was one of... <laughs> if, I, I believe he is the most bamboo-reads-under-the-fingernails annoying character I have ever met. <laughs> uh, which Matt, one was Jarvis I, again? The, the, That's the, the, station, the, uh, the station director. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. The, the guy, the guy who's pretty much a parody of the leader in denial trope. Yeah. Yeah, yes. he was. I, I, I hate that trope. I, I, I hate I it so much. I, I just won't, 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 I, 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 I wanted to flick his nose. <laughs> I couldn't tell if he was suffering from PTSD, if he was um, OCD to the point of autistic. They or where they were this. going with it. Yeah. I was just no, more. I was just more like seeing it. So... It seemed more like it was a fugue state. Like he was compartmentalizing anything that was on the book's job description and shoving it into a side of his brain that he was ignoring 
so that he could only see the things he wanted to see. So it was sort of a dissociative disorder of some sort. And, okay, and you were then, saying, Aaron? He, yeah. Didn't they kind of imply that he may be under control of Cybermen? They didn't directly point? imply it. Mm. Um, pro, uh, the doctor may have hinted at it, but they never went anywhere with it. Yeah. And if they, if he was, the question would have become how. Right. It's Since he the, was that way before the Cybermen even got on the wheel. It, it's just like he, he was the perfect storm of everything uh, I uh, dislike about fiction. Fiction. He was uh, the, the head in the sand, uh, the obstructive bureaucrat, the, the arbitrary skepticism, the, uh, the guy who refuses to listen to the people whose job it is to tell him what's what. Thankfully, the the uh, story itself starts to bury him away after the first couple of yeah. episodes. Yeah, and, and then to top it all off, he doesn't really get a, like, he could have redeemed himself with a heroic sacrifice, but something. his sacrifice wasn't that heroic. What what, what, what did promise. happen to him at the end? I, I remember um, him. That was actually, he suddenly uh... snaps out of his fugue state after uh, Gemma was killed. When he sees okay. her dead body on the screen, he kind of snaps out of his fugue state, walks out there, and we have no idea what he was trying to do. I think he was trying he, to get back it, to his quarters. No, he was, he was something with the Cybermen. He had to do something, but I don't remember what. But either way, the Cybermen caught him in the hallway and strangled him to death. Strangled him and then lifted, them, li lifted him while he was still moving over their heads and tossed him. Yeah, and then that they was shot him with a really cool beam scene. from their chest. Yep. Mm-hmm. So. It was kind of like they deliberately ma made him to be unlikable and then pointlessly killed him in the most nastiest way they could. That, yeah, yeah. that's what, Most that's, nasty, that's but what... also <laughs> probably the most uh, awesome because, again, I can see that the both actors are still there on screen as he's getting tossed. Con so that was a heck of a scene to it... pull. Considering that it looks like a satire and w was written by a writer that could not stand the base under siege premise, I'm pretty sure it was all on purpose. Possibly. Uh, probably the writer's idea of stop with these kind of characters, toss, strangle, laser beam, done. <laughs> now, if if only more slasher writers would do that with their uh, yes. With their versions of that character. <laughs> no kidding, right? Now, you know, I don't mind a character that has one of those flaws, but don't stack all of them on on one character. Yeah. I mean, having a character that's the skeptic, that's fine. But don't make him the mm. skeptic in control that's also sticking his head in the sand. No. Mm. Unless you kill him off really early. <laughs> Anywho, mm -hmm. anyway, oh, that was uh, that was what uh, John Saxon in Nightmare on Elm Street. To a degree. <laughs> anyway, Bill. Um, I actually did not have anything I disliked in my notes, but I think I'm going to go with episode one being essentially non-functional, and. As a, I mean, if this were back in the day where each episode has its own title and it was a serial adventure, I would be able to take it a little better. Or if there were two episodes on the, uh, what the hell is it called? The Silver something. I keep forgetting its name. But two epi if there were two episodes on the rocket in a row or something, I would kind of get it a bit more. But ultimately, it's an episode spinning its wheels, fighting a a robot that has nothing to do with the plot and if it wasn't added for padding it feels like it was and that's probably more of a crime than if it actually was and it just feels like that episode could have been put to much better use introducing characters or something okay well, it does but it takes itself to the last minute before it does all right Aaron yeah. how about you um, hmm. Yeah, let me just make sure that I have... Okay. Well, from my notes, um, I'm going to... The one thing that I didn't like that I made note of um, is kind of a piggyback off of Bill's thing, but it's kind of an overall kind of slowness to the story. 
for me. It seems like there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of kind of not much happening that really pushes the plot forward. Or if the plot goes forward and then it's kind of pushed back, it seems like they're, you know, they have to go out and get the uh, the doctor's rod from the the rocket and everything like that. And they do wind up finding out that the that the uh, the Cybermen are are you know searching for the doctor, but you know that's something that they could have maybe tapped into on the space station. In other words, this feels like it was a four-episode seri- serial that was dragged into six. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I've heard it I, described I, I won't argue that with that too, too much. I, I, I can see where you're coming from with that. Um, question, have, have you watched a lot of uh, First Doctor serials? I have not. Um, I've watched SF Debris kind of talking about some mm. of the lost episodes and stuff and about how they seemed, how they seemed to take four-episode stories and stretch it for the six Sometimes, yes. After watching something like The Keys of Marinus or The Reign of Terror, this feels positively fast-paced. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. The Keys of Marinus... I never bothered... The Keys of Marinus never bothered me. Oh, I felt that. Because each episode was basically looking for a key, so... Yeah, they could have sped it up, though. And yeah, while there are some stretching pains in this one, I think, it's not as bad as other episodes have been. That you yeah. stretch it too long. Of course, that there's also really the good. fact that this this is more of a sci-fi horror story, which is my wheelhouse anyway. Yes. So I'm less likely to be bothered by things like that than somebody who's you know who this isn't their particular genre. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I like the sci-fi horror s- series. You know, I like you know Alien and stuff. So, but this just mm-hmm. didn't seem to do it for me. Okay. Fair enough. Okay. So, my beef with this. You strip down the plot. This plot is essentially identical to the moon base. Kind of. Yeah. Only yeah. worse in about every way. Really? Yes. I, every place where the moon base shined, this kind of lays flat. I mean, the cyber design, I'll admit, is better. But I'm talking about the plot, the writing, and the characterization. Places where the Doctor outright shines in the moon base, he comes across here as kind of flat and tired. And that's probably because this was the end of a season filming for Troughton, and he was probably wearing a bit thin at this point. Sure. Um... Mm-hmm. But he does. You don't get as much of the mischievous man who's thinking about it all at the same time. Doctor in this, um, you, of course, he has a whole episode where he's unconscious and trying to and, catch up as best he can, and, and and trying and basically playing catch up. But he comes across as more um, concerned, worried than actually, you know, plotting in this. Well, he does come up with a few good plots towards the end, though, like the whole force field thing. There's, uh-huh. there's also there's a little bit less plotting because this is a situation where the Doctor doesn't need to be all that clever. As he's mentioned, this is someone he's faced time and time again. This is his fourth time in half as many seasons fighting the same enemy. So he's kind of got a rhythm going to it, which is also why, you know, they single him out to kill. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. But he also starts to pick up on their beats too, even though they're trying to uh, pull something new on him. Right. Yeah, and you know, there's not as much Doctor and Jamie playing off each other in this, leaving Fraser yeah. Hines to play off uh, off of uh, the new Zoe as well. But it kind of leaves Patrick Troughton without anyone to play off of. Yeah. I admit um, that is a which bit of makes, a downfall. makes his acting a little flat. I find most of the characters, the secondary characters, to be caricatures rather than characters. Certain and ways, yeah. Whereas I found the ones in the moon phase to be proper characters. When they got a chance to actually act, yes. Over it all in all, I find the moon base to be the better serial. And like I said, it's kind of painful because this is the second serial and it's essentially the exact same plot. Only a there's different also, location change. And there's also, I mean, granted, this should stand on its own and shouldn't need to be required when you look at it, but there's also the heavy implication that this story is intended to 
satirize and point out all the flaws in something like the moon base and say, hey, wouldn't you rather watch something more interesting than this? Mm. That's but that, you know, again, that needs to stand on its own rather than needing to be said okay. anyway. So. Mm -hmm. so, favorite scene, Matt? Favorite scene? Oh, should I or shouldn't I? Um... I um I, I have to say one of my favorite scenes is uh when Patrick does finally get to talk to the Cybermen and then he tricks them into the force field. Uh huh, yeah. Yeah, yeah he has this little epic moment where he gets to talk uh, to the I villains. I suppose and... you're here to kill me, yes. yes the the I suppose I've heard you're that here one cross quoted me. a few places. It it is one of his popular lines. Uh, and as a matter of fact it's also a clip used in Earthshock. Yes. A uh, very small clip of that is used in Earthshock. And, yeah, it's definitely one of his better moments with the Cybermen. You just see them standing there watching him closely like hawks. And he looks back at them and he's like, I suppose you're here to kill me. Bill, then come on. And he lures them right into a trap and just zaps one to death. That is a good scene. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tim. I liked uh, the scene uh, of the Cyberman floating in space... Uh, uh, waving their arms like beautiful ballerinas. <laughs> that, that was an amusing scene. That you don't forget that, yeah. The thing is, I don't know why, but as I watched that scene, you know the scene in the '89 Batman movie where the Joker starts shooting the the mob boss. Yeah. Remember the music that played there. <laughs> Da, yeah. da, da. <laughs> that started going through my head. Dun, dun, I don't know bum, why. Bum, 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 bum. <laughs> yeah. That just seemed to fit the Cybermen just waving their arms in space, trying to be canaries. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> they're attempting to float through space towards us. Uh, towards well, the you space see, they, they 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 heard that Daleks were based on ballerinas, so they wanted to be just as graceful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bill, what was your favorite <sighs> scene? I'm going to go with the most meta ending to a serial of all time in which the Doctor is essentially, so you want to travel on the TARDIS? Well, I will show you reruns. Here, here's an episode from my, from my previous season. Tell me what you think. <laughs> yeah, that was, it, it, that was meta. And I think it's about as meta as Doctor Who's ever gotten. No, no, I, know, I uh, take the, that back. The TARDIS data core mentions that it might be a unique instance in all of television history in the reruns actually be incorporate, being incorporated into the season plot. There is there is one more meta thing. Oh. And that is in Remembrance of the Daleks, way in the future, where they go back to 1963. Um, and Ace turns on a television. Oh, and watches Doctor Who, I think. It, it starts to do the, the BBC One narration opening for the episode of Doctor Who that week. <laughs> Where it's five o'clock here at the BBC, and once more it's time to go for an adventure in time and space with our BBC series, Doc... Cut. <laughs> yeah. That, I, I don't know, that one might win the, the meta points, but this is a close second, if not the outright winner. <laughs> okay, Aaron, what's your favorite scene? My favorite scene is going to pretty much echo, echo the scene that we saw from uh, last week, which was uh, the Cybermen emerging from their little balls. Like, yeah. Uh, it starts out as this bright, uh, you, you starts out as you see these kind of, these spheres kind of, kind of wobbling back and forth in the storage area, and all of a sudden they, you see them grow with this uh, white hot light, and the white hot light vanishes into these white silhouettes that you start seeing are humanoid form, and eventually you see recognize them as the forms of the Cybermen, and they finally punch through the uh, top of their spheres, which, you know, first they, at first they look like balloons, you know, just kind of wobbling there and everything, but then you realize that they think the Earth is a Who's typing? metallic stone-like substance. So, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, yes, 
that was great. I couldn't tell if it was animated or live the first time I saw it. I could tell it was live. Yeah. No, I just the restoration on that episode looked to be fairly good because it was not grainy at all. Yeah, um, they, they have moments. Yes. Okay, my favorite scene. Huh. I think it would have to be when Jamie met Zoe. <laughs> The mm -hmm. whole kilt conversation, everything, and those two just seem to immediately learn to play off each other. That that just you're hit me wearing as... females' garments. I think is how she's yes. Saying. The second she she starts laughing at him, and he finds oh, you can play too, huh? So yeah, that just hit me as good. So seeing seeing you seeing you didn't like Matt. Try to make it brief, because oh, we're starting yeah. to run out of time. We're, we're getting close. Um, scene I didn't like. Um, um, I have to say there are a couple of scenes here and there where these guys were talking very robotically, and no one seemed to figure out that they were under mind control, when it was very obvious that they the, were. The, the, the doctor knew he was under mind control. No, and everyone only else one time, like, what the hell are you talking but, about, doctor? The doctor only pushes that out once. Nobody else, is, after talking, numerous times, figured it out. The thing is, talking to various people, um, if you listen to their radio conversations and stuff, a lot of people are talking very mechanically for no reason in this episode. Uh, no, <laughs> these ones were particularly robotic. I remember noticing it a hell of a lot in everyone who was mind-controlled. Okay. It, it just right. stuck out to me. All right, Tim. Uh, I'd have to say uh, pretty much uh, of all the scenes I disliked was just uh, the one where uh, they catch Jamie uh, sabotaging the the laser beam beam and uh, Jarvis the bastard uh, just uh, just goes on and is like. He's like, yes, I'm going to demonstrate what a colossal douchebag I am very loudly and very aggressively. And uh, that that scene just annoyed yeah, if, the, if, if that the heck was out one of me. his lines, I think he would be a much more likable character. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Bill. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I do not like blink and you miss it resolutions to the climax. It's the Cybermen are invading, and then I think they spray them with what looks like fire extinguishers, and then they're gone. And it's just like, wait, that was it? And yeah, that... well, they very briefly yeah, explained the... it. Yeah, that was that magic. Was. Ma magic MacGuffin fluid makes Cyberman go away. Yeah. Um. You know, if it if it had a sign that said "Break glass in case of Cyberman," maybe, but. That would have been after one of the cyber wars. Mm -hmm. Okay. Didn't they also release the um, one of the in order to suck them back out into space? Then they release one of the um, 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 what do you call it? Oh God, I can't remember what it's called. I have no clue what you're going shield. on. Force shield. Oh yeah, yeah they, they, they use a force field to push it back out. Yeah. yeah, which is what they did in the moon base. Yeah, which is really where it hit me that this was the moon base done over again. Okay. Um, Aaron, least favorite, um, least favorite scene. Least favorite scene. Um. Uh. Let's see. <laughs> her notes, going over notes. I don't know if there was one scene that I really hated, though. Which is alright. Nothing that was, at least... Was there, was there a didn't... scene that made you groan and... Facepalm? I guess it was just the doctor and Jamie eating future food because it's like, hey, future food. That that mm. actually that that was something they talked about in uh in the Tomb of the Cybermen a bit as well. That scene with uh, Victoria. Mm -hmm. Although that I was guess, set farther in the future than this one. Yeah, I guess this was just kind of superfluous. So it, it wasn't terrible. 
it was played mostly for laughs, and it just kind of dra- made the episode mm-hmm. drag longer. That's that's fair. That's the same episode that I mentioned felt too much like padding to me. So yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah, so true. scene I didn't like. Um, I would have to go with as much as you wanted to see it was the death of um, of the director because it just made no sense as to his sudden change followed by his death. It just was like point not there. Um, Other okay. Than the killing him. What? Yeah. Other than just killing him, it just didn't. I mean, as far as the plot was concerned, it it it, it just seemed jumped to be, rabbits over your head. Yeah. Yeah. It it just went over. Anyway, so we are going to go to our final thoughts. Uh, Matt, go ahead with your final thoughts. This is the Moonbase uh, 2.0, but for Moonbase 2.0, it's still, despite some little lacking and the fact that the, some of the, our actors are getting tired because this has been a long season, I still think it still holds up compared to some other stories we could probably easily think of from this part of the uh, uh, franchise. Uh, so, in general, I would still suggest to see it done. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, Tim. Overall, uh, I thought this episode was story was just meh. Uh, uh, the uh, it uh, un- I-, I know it's unfair to say, but the fact that it was unfinished really brings it down. Telesnaps. Telesnaps. Um... Don't don't be. I'm going to be giving it some deduct point deductions for telesnaps as well. I've Snaps, always uh, done that. As well, and I've always said just, that. Yeah. It, it's based solely on what we can actually see, not what we think it would have been. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's what I have to say. And I always say that if they release the full version, I will probably revise my score. Yes. Retroactively, yeah. but mm-hmm. at this point, we have to go on what we have. Yeah, as well as the character of Jarvis really just brings it down for me. Yeah, they could have gotten yeah. rid of him a lot sooner, as far as I'm and, concerned. And with, uh, you know, the, the, like sort of the needless padding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Padding, I, think, uh, I, I can't, uh, like, I, I'd only recommend this to, like, if you're a diehard completionist. Or a really big Cyberman fan at the time. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Bill, your final thoughts? I enjoyed the Cybermen in this episode. Um, there are definitely some hair miss points and definitely some parts where it's uh, in a lot of ways similar to the moon base. Um, but I do enjoy the, the way the Cybermen are looking around the edges. I do enjoy the uh, Cyber Planner, uh, Zoe and Jamie playing off of each other. Um, ultimately, mm-hmm. I do think as a result I do end up enjoying this a bit more than some of the uh, more straightforward uh stories such as the moon base um but i would agree that it doesn't completely blow you know blow it out of the water it's not yeah. a massive change really in any in my in much of a way okay aaron um it was it was okay it was kind of mad a little bit too long i'm glad i saw it anyway because it's one of the episodes that i've kind of worked myself up to to wanting to watch uh, being a companion introduction episode so mm-hmm yeah. All right. Um, for me, yes, this was the moon base done again with bits of Tomb of the Cybermen added in only. Um, really, I think at this point, too many cooks spoiled the broth or the wrong cook following after the first cook really kind of turned the mix sour because um if you're going to make the moon base and make it better this could have had a lot of potential and everything just seems to fall short except for the BBC costuming department mhm oh speaking of the BBC costuming we didn't get to mention this matt we have about 5 minutes of broadcast time left well we have a little bit more than that but just really quickly uh the out- outdoor spacesuits were actually uh that were used on uh, Zoe and Jamie as well as a couple other characters were also refurnished and reused during the Star Wars trilogy, the original 70s to 80s trilogy. Um, technically not true. Um, both the both Lucas and um, Doctor Who got these suits from the same dealer who also mil- designed these suits for the Royal Air Force. Oh. 
So these were high. It's, it's still a similar make, and it's, it's very yeah, it's a, shows. it's a similar type. But if you look at it, the one that they claim is the one reused for Bosk is definitely of a darker color. Uh huh. So it's mm. very unlikely that it's the same one. If 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 it is, then they definitely had to uh, fix it up in between. Possibly, like, in yeah. Between, yeah. It's uh, it's adventures. these suits. Like I said, these suits were designed for the Royal Air Force to use in their high pressure jets. Uh, the little piece that that's the body armor piece was actually designed as body armor for pilots hmm. in the event of having landing. It's actually part of the suit. So yeah, it's I, just it's just Lucas and the BBC borrowing from actual military technology. Yep. So we will go now to our score, starting with you, Matt. Um. I would, I would really love to see more of this, but given what we can see, um, I guess I'll have to give this one another 3.5. I think if we could find more of it, it might go up higher, but that depends on how good the rest of it is that we don't get to see. All right. Tim? I uh, can't see myself giving this uh, any higher than two stars. Uh <laughs> Like this, uh, just w between uh, the annoying characters, the padding, and the telesnaps, it uh, was just uh, a below average story for me. Mm -hmm. All right, Bill? I think, and I've been debating on this because I think I gave the Moon Base a high 3.5, Tomb of the Cybermen a low 3.5. I think I'm going to give this a low 4.0. Uh, scores would be a little closer if we were going into uh, you know more varied uh, scores, but with no 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 farther than a half, I think I'm going to end up giving this a four. Okay, Aaron. I'm probably going to give this a three. Yeah, I mean it wasn't it wasn't terrible. I think it was a little bit less a little bit less than Moonbase. Mm-hmm. And less than Tomb of the Cybermen. Like, if I could, I would give it, like, a 2.75. Or 2.8. But that but rounds to so a 3, just, so... Yeah, yeah. I'll just round it up to a 3. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I'm looking at it this way. Um, this would have been a mediocre episode at best. It gets a point deduction for telesnaps. Um, but the acting of Jamie and Zoe off each other and the uh, revised Cybermen outfits gives it a little bit of a bump. So I am going to have to say two and a half. Uh, you, bro you, broke your you broke your streak of going down half a point with each uh, serial. Oh, what? You thought I was going to give it a 3.0 flat? I, 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 thought, I thought you would, too. I was, I was waiting for it to be 4.5. If, if there, if there was a... If there was, it, it, it has that telesnap deduction. That's uh, that's that hurts it. Yeah. It has it has. The, I have to deduct for it being telesnaps. Although on the plus side, that means for today's rating, we have a two, a two point five, a three, a three point five, and a four. Making this an so, exact three point four, three point zero average. The easiest to conduct, yes. So this is middle of the road, as group consensus goes. And I think this might be the biggest gap between Randy and my scores yet. <laughs> It's very awesome. rare that Bill and I have a very different view on an episode. Um, and yes, Bill is our high scorer at this, giving this a 4.0. Even above Matt, who is, uh, has uh, what I refer to as a Cyberman slant in most of his voting. A bit. He, he, I, I think you automatically give it at least a half-point bump if it's Cybermen. Sometimes, yes. Usually because Cybermen usually comes hand-in-hand hand with a semi-competent story, but the story kind of fell flat on this one. So, yeah, this um, 3.0 is our average for this one. Um, next week we will be dealing with the uh, um, ultimate uh, Patrick Troughton episode with the uh, Cybermen, The Invasion. Yep. Hmm. So, which, I, by I, the I, way, is out of print to purchase on DVD. I will talk more about my. Means it'll probably be one of the next. Oh, actually, no. They probably want to animate it before putting it out on Blu-ray. Oh, it was animated already. It was oh, already yeah. animated. Oh, okay, that's right. Oh no, that's right. The the one I watched was. Uh... 
uh, photo snaps, but I mean tele snaps. But yeah, I forgot they did animate it, didn't they? Uh-huh. Yes. So yes, they did. Um, I will discuss my my possible uh, theories on why the invasion has been pulled from circulation next week. Tune in then. We'll uh, take it away, Bill, time. for the closing. Okay. Uh, and as always, you can, uh, if you enjoy listening to us, you can visit our Patreon and you know throw in uh, whatever pocket change you feel like for your choice of rewards. You can always follow us on uh, Facebook and Twitter, uh, on Unearthly Podcast and Unearthly Pod. And of course, you can uh, watch our uh, po- li- watch and listen to our podcasts on twitch.tv slash madmat2185, you- uh, youtube.com slash madmatinc1, and uh, mixcloud.com, uh, search for Unearth- Unearthly Podcast. And, so, uh, and of course, join us next week for The Invasion, written by Derek Sherwin, from a story, of course, by Kit Pedler. And with that, good night, everybody. Good night. Night and night.